Apostle Paul closes his first letter to the church at Corinth in chapter 16 and verse 13 with these words. He says, Watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong. Across the centuries, Christians all over the world and at different times and different places have been persecuted. In the midst of persecution, out of the mid-third century, emerges a man called Cyprian, a man who had become known for his part in a difficult and divisive issue that faced the persecuted church in 249 AD. He'd also be remembered for his great Latin epistles and treatises he wrote, which were then unequaled, and are still respected as great writings today. Cyprian appears to have come from a wealthy family. He was well educated in Carthage, North Africa, and he was renowned for his eloquent speaking, his teaching of rhetoric, and the incredible mastery he had of debate and argument. At age 40, Cyprian becomes Christian. He quickly rises through the clergy from deacon to presbyter to bishop. He's popular with the people because along with his oratory gifts, he appears to be a genuinely compassionate Christian who advocates practical charity. Perhaps some of the other clergy were jealous because some did not support his rise to bishop, and later this has some impact on the issue arising in the church. His earliest written work was a letter to a friend entitled Ad Donatum. He recounts the evils of Roman society, and he records his conversion. I was tossing about on a sea of a restless world, wavering and doubtful in my wandering steps, a stranger to the truth and the light. I thought it indeed difficult and hard to believe that divine mercy was promised for my salvation. How, I said, is such a conversion possible? For as I myself was held enlivened by the very many errors of my previous life, of which I believed that I could not divest myself. But afterwards, when I had drunk of the Spirit from heaven, a second birth restored me into a new man. Immediately, in a marvellous manner, doubtful matters clarified themselves. The closed opened, the shadowy shone with light. What seemed impossible was able to be accomplished, so that it was possible to acknowledge that what formerly was born of the flesh and lived submissive to sins was earthly. And what the Holy Spirit already was animating began to be of God. Cyprian held the office of bishop whilst under the Roman rule of Emperor Decius in 249 AD. For most of the past 50 years, persecution had been in abatement. Christianity had been growing in huge numbers among all classes of people. However, Decius is an old school kind of Roman. His desire is to see Rome restored in all her ancient glory. And he sees that restoring the ancient religion of Rome will be the unifying factor in achieving his aim. He believes that if all the peoples would honour the gods, then they, the gods, would bestow their favour on the empire. Decius decrees that everyone must sacrifice to the gods and burn incense to a statue of himself. He knows this will go against Christian teaching and he hopes to force them to recant. A certificate called Libeli was issued to everyone who had sacrificed to prove their obedience to the decree. Everyone was required to have one. The certificate was excavated in Egypt. And the following translation says, To those in charge of the sacrifices of the village Theodelphia, from Aurelia Bellius, daughter of Paterus, and her daughter Capinus, we have always been constant in sacrificing to the gods, and now too, in your presence, in accordance with the regulations, I have poured libations and sacrificed and tasted the offerings, and I ask you to certify this for us now. May you continue to prosper. We, Aurelius Serenus and Aurelius Hermus, saw you sacrificing. I, Hermus, certify. In the first year of the Emperor Caesar Gaius, Messius Quintius, Starinus, Decius, Pius, Felix, the Augustus. The the Christians were divided. Faced with threats and torture, and even death, there were different reactions to persecution. Some are quick to offer sacrifice, and they fell away from their faith. There were Christians who forged certificates in order to dupe the authorities. Some did offer sacrifice, but later repented of their actions. And those who stood against the persecution, continually confessing their faith, they became known as the confessors. Whilst some were martyred, others lived to play a pivotal role in the church. While well, Cyprian expects the authorities to descend on him at any moment, requiring his sacrifices to the Roman gods. He's already heard of the Bishop of Rome's martyrdom, leaving the church at Rome without its leader. He's a difficult decision to make. He decides to leave and hide in a secure place. His motivation was to ensure the church has a continual leadership, albeit from afar, 
Over the next year or so, he continues to write regularly to the church at Carthage, and when it's safe, he returns to his role as bishop in Carthage. However, there he finds some opposition from fellow Christians. Some clergy view Cyprian as a coward, someone who's neglected to stand for his faith, preferring the safety of hiding to steadfast faith and possible death. In the midst of this arises an issue that rocks the church. What to do with those who betrayed their faith? They became known as the lapsed. Should they be readmitted to the church? How does the church know they're truly repentant? Different factions discuss the best approach according to the varying levels of betrayal, and debate mounts as to who holds the authority to make the decision. Cyprian as bishop assumes authority, but he's in competition with the confessors who believe because of their faithful stand, they alone have authority to make the decision. While Cyprian is supported by some, others side with the confessors due to antagonistic attitudes towards Cyprian because of his perceived cowardice earlier. The debate rages about the issue between the church's purity and the church's forgiving nature. The confessors wanted to accept the lapse back in what we might call a fairly wholesale way. Cyprian wants to protect the unity and the purity of the church and devises a method that varies according to the level of betrayal. Those who forged the certificate were admitted back to the church immediately. Others who actually sacrificed could only be admitted to the church on their deathbed, though later this was mitigated to demonstrating their repentance through years of penance and teaching. He believed that those who had sacrificed and showed no remorse should never be admitted to the church. A third approach championed by Novation, who took the role of Bishop of Rome in 251 in opposition to Pope Cornelius. He was much tougher on the lapsed and he saw Cyprian's attitude as lenient and weak. Later though, he was excommunicated, though for centuries a following of Novation continued. Cyprian called a synod of the bishops, and they ruled in favour of Cyprian's stand on the lapsed. Whilst this process began to be carried out, though there remained many who rejected his decision, and a schism grew in the Carthage church. The desire Cyprian had to regulate the re-entry of the lapsed into the church came from his view of the church. The unity of the church was vital to him. He wrote much about the unity of the church in response to this time. In Matthew 16, the Lord says to Peter, I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. This unity we ought to hold and preserve, especially we who are presiding over the church as bishops, that we may prove the episcopate itself to be one and undivided. Let no one deceive the brotherhood with falsehood. The church is a unity. Even as the sun has many rays, but one light, and a tree many boughs, but one trunk, whose foundation is deep-seated root, so also is the church flooded with the light of the Lord, extended her rays all over the globe. Yet it is one light which is diffused everywhere, and the unity of the body is not broken up. Cyprian saw that the church unity would be undermined by the confessor's actions, who had no provision in place to protect the church from apostates. He was much influenced in his decision by Tertullian, who was appalled at the thought of readily accepting the lapsed into the church. This might seem difficult for us in our comfortable Christian lives to understand, but for the early church this was a major issue, and it continued to be for some time, eventually leading to the doctrine and system of penance. In 256 a new wave of persecution under Valerian led to Cyprian's arrest. He refuses to sacrifice, and he firmly professes his faith in Christ. He is killed by the sword, with his last words reputed to be, Thanks be to God. Cyprian today is revered by the Roman Catholic Church as a saint, and he certainly serves as an example of the difficulties faced in different circumstances in wanting to follow God and honour the Church. I'm going to leave you with some of his wisdom written in the year he died for his faith in his treatise on the advantage of patience, and I hope that his words inspire and encourage you in your faith. But for us, beloved brethren, who are philosophers, not in words but in deeds, we do not speak great things but live them. Let us, as servants and worshippers of God, show in our spiritual obedience the patience which we learn from heavenly teachings. Mm.